Now In Search of History explores a family whose evil deeds sent shockwaves through Renaissance Rome. Uncover a saga filled with poison, incest, and murder, bound in ties of blood. Fifteenth century Rome, at the very height of the Italian Renaissance. A flowering of all the arts, painting, architecture, sculpture, music, and literature. A time when men of immense talent, such as da Vinci and Michelangelo, gave voice to a glorious new celebration of the human spirit. One family would come to dominate the cultural life of this era. Yet strangely, this very family which would underwrite some of the world's great art was also one of the most evil and secretive in history. The Borgia family has become the arch symbol of treachery, of decadence, of violence, of assassination, of carnal lust, of every manner of moral turpitude we can think of. The Borgia's reputation for depravity is nearly unparalleled in history. While tales of their infamy persist to this day, there are some who question whether the Borgias were really guilty of the vile crimes attributed to them. Pope Alexander VI, the father of several illegitimate children, said to have concocted a deadly recipe for poison which he routinely used to silence his enemies. Juan, his evil-tempered son, believed to have ordered the execution of a dinner guest over an unintended insult. Cesare, the most skillful and vicious military tactician of his day, accused of slashing the throat of his brother Juan. and Lucrezia, a golden-haired child bride whose alleged affair with her father, the Pope, sent shockwaves through Roman society. For centuries, scholars have wondered if these four individuals could have been so utterly without conscience. It was in the year 1456, at the age of 25, that Alexander began his climb to power in a corrupt church by buying himself an appointment as cardinal. He was a brilliant man, extraordinarily eloquent, a very clever politician, strategist, diplomat. He was a man of commanding physical presence. A vigorous man in all respects, Alexander had no intention of curbing his sexual appetite in spite of wearing the crimson robes of the church. In this, he was not unusual. Celibacy goes against nature. There wasn't a cardinal in Rome who didn't have a concubine and didn't have children. And of course, Alexander had many children and had had quite a few mistresses. His favorite mistress was Venoza Catanei, who bore him four children. By all accounts, he was a loyal family man with high aspirations for his offspring. In an ironic twist of fate, 
the seeds of his destruction would lie in this lavish devotion to his children. Alexander VI's family meant everything to him. Uh, he loved his children very deeply. All the historians agree on that about him. His love of his children was so excessive that it led him into many of his worst mistakes. Alexander was determined that his children should enjoy all the benefits that wealth and power could buy. To help assure their high station, he removed them from their mother's house when they were very young. This was a very calculated decision. It was not considered appropriate for Lucrezia or any of her siblings to be raised by their mother. It ultimately didn't fit in with Alexander's ambitions about the rise of his family. I think it reminded them of the taint of illegitimacy raised by their father. They were and could become legitimate. On a hot August morning in the year 1492, Alexander ascended to the ultimate office of the Catholic Church. He was elected Pope. But even this did not satisfy Alexander's boundless ambition. The Italy of his day was a loose confederation of hostile city-states now that he was Pope, Alexander hoped to unite these warring principalities under his control. In effect, he would become the ruler of much of Italy. He viewed the marriage of his children as a powerful tool for realizing these ambitions. Child marriage was not uncommon. And although his beloved daughter Lucrezia was barely 13, Alexander was determined to use her as a pawn in his deadly game of politics. Girls were married very, very young. Sometimes the husband had to wait before they had sex together because the girl was, was so young. But this, this was common. And of course, love had nothing to do with it. Usually. The first time the girl saw the husband was the day of the wedding. Alexander betrothed Lucrezia to Giovanni Sforza, a member of the most powerful family in northern Italy. The couple was married in the Vatican with all the pomp and ceremony of a royal wedding. After the service, Alexander had to face that transition which can be so difficult for doting fathers, the letting go. But the true nature of the relationship between Alexander and Lucrezia would become a wellspring of rumor for the people of Rome, a haunting question that would begin to weaken and undermine Alexander's rule even as he consolidated his power. Pope Alexander, hoping to extend his rule over the entire Italian peninsula, was not above using his own daughter Lucrezia as a pawn in his political strategy. At the age of 13, she was married off to a complete stranger twice her age. As Alexander watched Lucrezia recite her marriage vows, however, he found himself overcome by feelings of jealous longing. After the ceremony, the Pope did something that, by the standards of the 20th century, seems almost incomprehensible. He followed Lucrezia and her husband into the bridal chamber. According to the primary sources, when Lucrezia went to bed with Giovanni Sforza, who was her first husband, 
Alexander was there to make sure the marriage had been consummated. Now, of course, he didn't actually watch them. There was a sheep there. What he was doing was what every father, every relative did. People were always present when the young couple had sex for the first time. Marriage was viewed as a legal contract, sealed and fulfilled by the first act of intercourse. We can only wonder what thoughts passed through Alexander's mind as he watched another man caress his daughter. For the Pope's relationship with Lucrezia was anything but ordinary. According to all accounts, the two enjoyed an unusually intimate bond. Lucrezia had an almost fatal desire to please. Alexander was a very adoring father and very, very affectionate with her. And of course, she wanted Daddy to always think of her as wonderful. Even after Lucrezia was married, her life would continue to be dominated by her larger-than-life father. The Pope was reported to have frequently questioned the girl about her marriage in a manner that revealed the true depth of his possessive feelings. Within three years, a shift in political alliances gave Pope Alexander the excuse to take another look at the match he had ordered and begin to consider that he had made a mistake. Then Giovanni made a crucial announcement he informed the Pope that he was leaving Rome and taking Lucrezia with him. Determined to keep his daughter by his side, the Pope took the first step in a sequence of events that would eventually undermine the stability of the Borgia regime. He decided that Lucrezia's marriage must be annulled. How, in an age when divorce was considered an act of blasphemy, would it be possible for the Pope to dissolve his own daughter's marriage? Impotency was really the, the primary way that you could produce an annulment. Um, if the marriage had not been consummated, then, and no children had been produced, then in the eyes of the Church, it had not been a legal marriage. Giovanni Sforza responded to the deeply insulting charge that he was impotent by demanding the chance to prove his manhood in public. Sforza had volunteered to basically perform sexually in front of people who were considered to be qualified witnesses. Now, since Alexander had no desire to show that his son was capable of consummating a marriage, the trial never went forward. Giovanni Sforza now went on the offensive by making a shocking accusation. He accused the Borgia family of every manner of unspeakable crime, including incest. He asserted that uh, the father wanted the daughter back in order to continue their illicit sexual union. Whether the charge of incest was true remains one of history's unanswered questions. I can't believe that the rumors of incest are true. Everything we know about Alexander as a father, he, he may have sometimes had incestuous thoughts. Most fathers do, most daughters do at one point or another, but between uh, Thinking and acting, there's a great chasm. Fearing that Alexander would take away his small fiefdom, Giovanni eventually backed down and agreed to admit that he was indeed impotent. How then was it possible that this episode could blacken the Borgia's reputation forever? 
The rumor of incest, begun by a humiliated husband, was to be taken up by other enemies of the family. Foremost among these was Francesco Guicciardini, a preeminent historian and one of the most influential men of the Renaissance. He conceived a loathing for the Borgia family. He believed that they were responsible for many of the evils that not only overtook the church, but overtook uh, Italy as well. And so he became one of their most implacable foes. He simply hated them and hated all of them. Now another charge began to circulate, one even more sensational than that of incest. It was said that the Pope routinely disposed of his enemies with poison. One of the reasons why poison is so associated with the Borgias is that poison allows you to do in an enemy or a rival without having to personally be there wielding the sword or the dagger. It was the perfect weapon for the kind of really duplicitous politics that went on. You could be smiling in the face of a political rival and praising him while at the same time you knew that that evening his servant was going to slip him a flagon of wine which would finish him off. Is it possible, as claimed, that the Borgias perfected a secret recipe for poison? Most of these stories about Borgia poisoning with the famous Cantarella, which was the, the, the Borgia powder, as it was called, most of these stories, uh, most of these poisonings never could have occurred. Uh, that doesn't mean that um, that the charge is completely groundless. Why did the young and beautiful Lucrezia, more than any other member of her family, become the one associated with poison? The most likely answer offers a disturbing insight into an attitude which endures in some degree to this very day. Poisoning in general has always been considered kind of a sneaky way of doing someone in. And it's unfortunate, but part of the teachings of the Christian church during this time centered on the notion that women were inherently uh, untrustworthy. I mean, after all, you know, Eve had listened to the snake and that's why everyone had been kicked out of, out of Eden. And uh, so women were characterized in general as uh, having a bent for evil, for deceit. Rumor said she had perfected an ingenious way to deliver a fatal dose of this poison to her enemies through a ring drenched in arsenic. There's also a story about the ring having a secret little needle hidden in it that was impregnated with some sort of poison or venom. And that way you could walk up to someone and pat them on the back or take them by the hand and by the merest pinprick they would be poisoned. Damaging as these rumors were, the Borgia dynasty seemed to be invincible. But all that was soon to change. By the year 1497, many believed that Pope Alexander VI was defiling the sanctity of the Catholic Church. Some even claimed that he was a cold-blooded murderer who had annulled his own daughter's marriage in order to continue their sexual affair. Seemingly unconcerned by these rumors, Alexander hungered for even greater power. In order to strengthen his position, he planned a military campaign that would subdue the hostile city-states of Italy and hold an invading French army at bay. 
Alexander thought he knew just the man to lead this onslaught. He summoned back from Spain his favorite son, Juan Borgia. Quite unwittingly, the Pope had set the stage for a murder mystery. For Alexander's other son, Cesare, who had always seethed under the favoritism he believed was shown to his brother, now was certain that he had been unfairly passed over as the one to lead his father's army. Jealousy was inflamed into dangerous fury when Juan began to pursue the passionate Sancha of Aragon, who was none other than Cesare's mistress. It was only weeks after Juan's return to Rome that the brothers dined at their mother's house in the Piazza Pizzo di Merlo. After the meal, Juan and Cesare bid their mother good night and disappeared down a darkened street. The next afternoon, a fisherman pulled the mangled corpse of Juan out of the Tiber River. The following day, his eyes red and swollen from weeping, the Pope addressed a solemn assembly of his cardinals. The blow which has fallen upon us is the heaviest that we possibly could have sustained. We loved Juan more than anyone else in the world. We would give 70 aras to be able to recall him to life. God has done this in punishment for our sins. Pope Alexander VI, 1487. For the first time in his life, the Pope was filled with a sense of foreboding. Deep in his heart, he feared the unspeakable, that his own diabolic acts had finally come back to haunt him. It is certainly a story of people wanting to hurt, to strike at the very heart of Alexander's empire. There was nothing more insulting than defaming the body of a corpse, and to have the son of a pope, in fact, the favored son of a pope, thrown into the river like a carcass, washed up on the shore. But the killer may not have been an enemy of Pope Alexander. He may have been an enemy of Juan. The killer may have been Juan's own brother, Cesare. Many historians have pointed out and Guicciardini first among them, that Cesare Borgia had a motive to kill his brother because he was jealous of him, jealous of his station, jealous of his future. The Pope, however, refused to consider that Cesare might be guilty. Perhaps he was simply unable to. Choosing to believe that his enemies lay outside the family, Alexander took steps to forge a new and powerful alliance. Once again, he viewed Lucrezia as the means to cementing this alliance. He betrothed her to Alfonso, the son of the King of Naples. It was yet another arranged marriage, but Lucrezia's reaction upon seeing Alfonso has been described as that miraculous and overpowering phenomenon known as love at first sight. 
Here was this young man who was supposed to be unbelievably good looking. And he was also a very gentle person, as I think Lucrezia was. They called it a thunderbolt. The political marriage turned out to be a love match, and the delight the young couple took in one another became the talk of Rome. Within six months, Lucrezia announced that she was expecting a child. Then one morning, Alexander wrote to Lucrezia with shattering news. He had arranged a marriage for her brother Cesare with a French princess, and this alliance was in conflict with the one that had been made through her own marriage. The ties with Alfonso's family would now have to be broken. Alfonso, believing his life in danger, fled, leaving behind the pregnant Lucrezia. Lucrezia pleaded with her father to guarantee protection for her husband. The Pope seemed to be deeply moved by his daughter's pleas. He sent an envoy after Alfonso, assuring the young man of his safety. The young couple was reunited. Within a month, Lucrezia gave birth to a healthy baby boy. In gratitude, she named him after her father. Lucrezia, however, may not have had genuine grounds for gratitude. For as the young mother rejoiced in the miracle of her newborn child, an unseen enemy plotted an end to her joy. Historians have pointed out that Alexander was an immensely devious man. No one knows if he really intended to let Alfonso live or was merely biding his time, waiting for the opportune moment to strike. It has been said that Pope Alexander's possessive love for his daughter was the single most powerful force in his life. Many claimed, now that Lucrezia had found happiness in the arms of another, that Alexander was tormented by jealous longing. By all accounts, Lucrezia and Alfonso continued their happy idol until that fateful summer night in 1500. After dining in his apartments at the Vatican, Alfonso announced that he was going out for a stroll. As he emerged from St. Peter's, the holiest of all sanctuaries, he was not surprised to see pilgrims sleeping on the steps. The murderous assault came from behind. Deeply cut about the neck and shoulders, his clothes soaked in his own blood, Alfonso was carried back to the Vatican. It seemed unlikely that he would survive the night. Lucrezia fainted when she saw him. The Pope arranged round-the-clock protection to guard against further assaults by the mysterious assassins. Yet six weeks after the attack, someone, somehow, was able to sneak into the room where Alfonso was recuperating and to strangle him. Lucrezia was devastated. The depth of her sorrow has been given immortal form in a poem written by one of her close friends. 
Why may I not go down to the grave with thee? Would that my fire might warm this frigid ice and turn with tears this dust to living flesh and give to thee anew the joy of life. Then would I boldly, ardently confront the man who snapped our dearest bond and cry, cruel monster, see what love can do. Barbara Torelli, 1508. Well-founded rumors soon circulated through the papal court that the assassin was none other than Cesare's most trusted henchman. Now that Alfonso was dead, the alliance with France that Cesare and Alexander had so desired could go forward. Had Cesare been carrying out his father's orders, or was he acting on his own, doing what his father could not bear to do? As for Lucrezia herself, the demands of her family forced her to choose blood over marriage and tolerate this tragedy. All of Rome knew who was responsible for Alfonso's death, but because absolutely secure evidence, documentation, were lacking, she eventually accepted this crime and, and worse, forgot about it as, as part of the family dynamic over which she always would remain powerless as long as her father and brother lived. She never was anything but their pawn. The family now seemed caught in a web of evil from which there was no escape. It was as though murder had a life of its own a dark force which could just as easily turn back against the very men who had unleashed it. At the beginning of the 16th century, the Borgia family found itself close to realizing its dream of becoming a powerful force in European politics. Under Cesare's direction, the papal army swept through central Italy, conquering every town in its path. Of all the Borgias, it was Cesare that history would remember the most vividly. Cesare was an exceptionally violent man who gave free reign to his uh, violent impulses and impulses for revenge. Although he could not have known it, and might not have cared, Cesare's ruthless cunning and political dexterity would earn him a unique immortality. The writer Niccolo Machiavelli adopted him as the model of how power is to be achieved, held, and used. From this arises the question whether it is better to be loved more than feared, or feared more than loved. The reply is that one ought to be both feared and loved, but as it is difficult for the two to go together, it is much safer to be feared than loved. The Prince, Niccolo Machiavelli, 1512.
Despite their skill as political leaders, however, neither Alexander nor Cesare realized that as their power grew, their situation became more precarious. Of all the warning voices they should have heeded, perhaps the most strident was that of the Dominican monk Girolamo Savonarola. Come hither, O degenerate church. Your vessels you turn to pride and your sacraments to simony. In lasciviousness you have become a shameless whore. You are worse than the beast. You are a monster and an abomination. Girolamo Savonarola, 1498. Savonarola fundamentally stood for the reform of the church. He was one of the most eloquent and powerful and passionate voices in Italy, claiming that the church had to reform itself lest it lose all spiritual vitality. And he thought of the Borgia family as the epitome of what was wrong with the church. Savonarola predicted that the destruction of the Catholic Church was close at hand. Alexander replied by having him hung from a scaffold as flames licked at his feet. Then, in the summer of 1503, after attending a dinner party, Alexander and his son Cesare were overcome by a mysterious malady. For days, both hovered near death. Had they fallen victim to illness or intrigue? Cesare recovered. Alexander, a man in his early 70s, did not. The hideous appearance of his corpse gave rise to rumors of murder. It was Guicciardini who told us in great detail of what the corpse of Alexander looked like on his death in 1503, the black and swollen tongue, the body so large and bloated, he alleged from poison, that no one could stuff it into the casket without stomping on it several times. Had Alexander, the reputed master of poison, himself succumbed to a poison elixir? Some even claimed that his death was brought about by a macabre accident, his own fumbled attempt to murder a cardinal. Today, however, forensic experts question the theory that the bloated corpse was a sure sign of poisoning. It's a great story, but it just doesn't match the situation that we know about. We know that Rome in the summer of 1503 was full of malarial fever, that, that Alexander more likely died of natural causes. And so as a result, the, the, the story about the poison is, I think, the most important part of the myth rather than the reality of the Borgia. The family seemed menaced by a sinister curse, for Cesare was also to meet a violent end, hacked down on the battlefield in the year 1507. But there was to be another chapter in the Borgia legacy, perhaps the most important. Lucrezia would still be alive to witness the momentous event when, in 1517, Martin Luther nailed his declaration on the door of a church in Wittenberg, Germany, 
and began the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Revolt, that great upheaval in religious belief, had come about in large part as a reaction against the excesses of the Borgia Pope, Alexander. We need to think of the criticisms of Alexander's papacy and his unbridled ambitions as ultimately being yet one more link in the chain that leads to Martin Luther in 1517 and to the splintering of Christianity not many years after that. The predictions of Savonarola, the monk that Alexander burned at the stake, had come true. The Catholic Church was rent apart. 500 years later, it is the legend of Borgia infamy that persists, leaving us to puzzle over the nature of Renaissance politics and a system so corrupt that it caused one family to turn against its own flesh and blood. It's the legacy of unlimited ambition that intrigues us as we go in search of history.